God bless you, everyone. I mean, it's so good to be here. You know, there's a lot of truths that cannot be changed. The truth is truth. Um, but sometimes when you hear truth again, or you hear where everything comes from and what God is trying to do, it just brings everything back into perspective. And um, you may have a seat. Um, thank you, Pastor Mona, for always loving me from the very first day. It was just love at first sight. And, um, and that connection is reciprocal. About 10 years ago, in my private prayer room, I experienced the tangible power of God. It wasn't just this, oh, I got chills. It was this thing that just met me right where I was like never before. It was so powerful what came over me. And um, as I began to pray and I released my prayer, I was wa it was almost like watching behind the scenes how instantly as I released the words, they would come back to me with answers. It was this this, this moment, like I had never experienced before, I had heard about prayer, I had prayed before, God had answered my prayers, but I started to discover that there is a deeper level in prayer, that the prayer that I knew was not um, all that enveloped in the prayers that the Bible tries to teach us. My petitions were barely leaving my mouth, and I could, I could see the answers running back to me. Like physically, I could see them just running to me. And after seeing this, immediately I went into, usually you would think after an experience like that, you're like, yes, oh my God, that was so awesome. Something, the opposite happened to me. I began to, to question if there is that much power in prayer, then why are there so many unanswered prayers? If we are the church of Jesus Christ, and what God is showing me, because I knew what he was showing me, it was not just for me. I knew that he was trying to tell me that the church needs to go deeper in prayer, that there's a whole new level of prayer. That's why I, it's, it's no coincidence that today, this morning, you began with prayer. It is no coincidence that we're talking about this rebirth. Um, Pastor Matt yesterday said something really important. He said that rebirth is, um, it, it, you have to begin to retrain just the basics. You know, all the things that you think you know how to do when you're reborn, you can't look at it, oh yeah, I know how to pray. No, you don't know how to pray. When you're reborn, it's a whole new level, it's a whole other experience, and you can't learn to pray the way that you used to pray. If not, you're going to find yourself in the need of rebirth one more time. We have to go from glory to glory. So 10 years ago, after that experience, I sit down and I start going into the word of God. I begin to ask God, show me where this power is. I want to show the church what, where we can acquire this, what I'm calling the active and effective power of prayer. Because there are a lot of people praying, but there's not a lot of active and effective prayer. And that's what we need to get to. And I was saying, Lord, teach me. So I go in and I grab my computer. Back in those days, I used to have a Sony Vio, I think it was. It was like we didn't really do like all that email stuff or anything. So I start writing and I finish that book like this. It was like this download and I finished it. All I needed to write was the intro. And then a virus came into my computer and ate it all up. And I was heartbroken. I was so heartbroken. I was like, I was almost done with this thing, and I knew this was going to be a blessing to the church. It was blessing my life. I was so excited. I was about to become an author, and all these wonderful things, and a virus just took it away. In an instant, it was gone. So my brokenhearted self, it took me about two years to recover, and after two years, I just I, I felt that thing again. No, no, no. God wants to teach the church about prayer. He wants to teach me about prayer. So I just sat down and I started writing again. But this time, it was not going to get me. Now, this is eight years ago. So now we used to use those external hard drives. 
right? So I would save in my computer, save in my external hard drive, and I would do the work, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and God is downloading, and I'm writing, and all is well. And then a virus gets into my external hard drive and corrupts my computer. And I lost it all over again. But somebody say rebirth. Because today, here at the Dash Conference, for the very first time, we are introducing the book Prayer Walks. About a year ago. See, because the enemy will lie to you. After that second experience, I said to myself, well, it must be that God does not want this information to come out. It must be that that. I am just not learning what he is teaching me, and I really don't know what prayer is. And I started to get confused about my own personal prayer life because this thing was not happening. So sometimes we see the obstacles and we think that God is placing them there, but it's because he has an appointed time for everything. And guess what? Third time is a charm. And it's the best version out of all the versions. So today, I'm going to be speaking to you. And look how, how appropriate God is. And he's so, like, detailed that prayer walks, um, walks is an acronym. And it stands for five steps into regaining the active and effective power of prayer. And this book is written for the church of Jesus Christ. It's not written just for women. It's written for men. It's written to the church of Jesus Christ. Walks is an acronym. It's wake up and see, ask, seek, and knock. Look to complete the mission, keep the focus on Jesus, and stand up and walk. And this morning, I'm going to be speaking on wake up and see. And wake up and see has everything to do with rebirth and baptism. It has to do with coming to life and dealing with the waters. And today, as we get ready to speak for the very... um, first time on the release of this book, I just ask the presence of God to come into this place. Lord, I I pray that everything that you have been depositing into my spirit for the last 10 years would be effective and active this morning, Lord. Lord, take us to a whole new level of prayer, of conversation with you. Lord, where the world can truly see that you are God, not by the things that we say, but the things that we pray and then we watch you do. Because you are the one who is working all things for our good, oh God. And you want the world to be saved, Father. And through our actions, Lord, through our prayers, Father, I know that you are going to change the world that's around us. So bless these women. Open their ears and their hearts, Lord, to receive your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. So wake up and see. Um, This chapter, uh, there's a few points that the Lord told me that I needed to speak to the church about us coming to an understanding. And I think when I think about wake up and see in reference to rebirth, I think about when babies were born and the doctors, you know, back in the day, they would hold them through the legs and they would spank them to wake them up, right? Right after they were born. Um, You can't do that anymore because spanking is just not allowed anywhere. Shh, don't tell my kids. Um, But now, now they take the babies and they massage them or whatever. But whatever the technique, There has to be something that comes in to motivate you to just wake up. Because um, the story that each chapter has a story, a biblical story where we're trying to extract the principles of the word of God. Because we cannot go by what we think prayer is. We cannot go by what we were taught prayer is. We need to go by what the word of God says prayer is. Because we have some excellent teachers, but we also have some some teachers that are teaching um, out of other things outside of the word of God. So we want to go into the scriptures and see what does the scripture say. So the first chapter prayer um, on prayer walks, wake up and see, is based on the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. 
He was a, a prophet is someone who hears God, who obeys God. God speaks to the prophet, and the prophet speaks right back to the people. And Jonah was a good prophet. He, he had been a prophet for a very long time. This was not anything new to him. He was used to hearing God and speaking unto uh, the people, whatever God was saying to him. Now, the church of Jesus Christ, the first thing we got to wake up and see is that we are the church. We're just like Jonah. We are not a new institution. Just like Jonah, we've been around quite a long time. And like Jonah, we know who we are. Our job is to hear God, to obey God, and to do whatever God is asking us to do. But somewhere along the line, in this um, operation called the Church of Jesus Christ, there's this wonderful thing that we have benefited from, and it's called the grace of Jesus and the grace of Jesus can take us and transform us and make us new. The grace of Jesus is one of the most, is the best anti-aging product that there is out there. There is nothing quite like the grace of Jesus Christ. Every day, everything is brand new. The smile that it puts on your face, the burdens that it takes off your shoulders, your posture gets better. Like you just look beautiful when you put this this wonderful grace of Jesus. So the church of Jesus Christ has been walking around with this wonderful grace. But one of the things and dangers that happens when we don't consistently remember where the grace comes from and we just uh, begin to bask in the benefits of grace is that we can forget that there is a responsibility that comes with the grace. There is a reason why you have received grace. God has separated us, has cleansed us, has beautified us, has allowed us to be reborn so that we can demonstrate his glory, his power, and establish his will here on earth. We are the bride of Jesus Christ. We are the body of Jesus Christ. We are today's mouthpiece to the world. We are his people, and we cannot forget that. Now, sometimes when you are looking good, like some people yesterday saw Pastor Mona. She always looked good, right? She, you look at her and you're like, come on, really? But she did something yesterday. That grace that made her look beautiful, she was like, you know what? That's not the most important thing, looking like I have grace. I'm going to go in those waters, and I don't care about my hair. I don't care about my eyelashes. I don't care about anything. But the church of Jesus Christ, we want to be so good looking that we don't want to get dirty. We don't want to get involved with things. We'll pray for the things that we know that are easily going to be resolved. If you, we'll pray while handing you an Excedrin. Come on, Lord, da, 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 da. We want the easy things, but those things that are kind of hard, we're like, okay, we need to gather as many people. And then if God doesn't do whatever he says he's going to, whatever we ask him to do, then, then I have more people that can share the blame. We're walking around as if prayer is wishful thinking, is, is hoping. Every prayer is like, yeah, well, you know, maybe. And the prophet Jonah, he knew that God was calling him to go to the Ninevites and preach the word of God. And he was good being a prophet, so God asked him to do something that he didn't want to do. As long as God is asking us to pray for the things that we want, those prayers are easy. But how about when God is asking us to pray for the people that we do not like? How many of us pray for the president of the United States of America? Oh, some of you are like, you know what? The Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. You, you might not like, but the church of Jesus Christ, we are called to be the light. We are called. Who do you think can change the mind and the opinions of the president that you don't like? There's only one person that can influence him. But we have to learn that we have to pray in good times and in bad times for the things that we don't want sometimes as long as they're the will of God. The will of God is what trumps everything here. 
When Jonah was asked to go to the Ninevites, he was like, nope, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And the first thing we got to wake up and see is that we are the church of Jesus Christ. If we are all these things that we said before, we are the body of Christ, we are his mouthpiece, we, we are the bridegroom, then whatever he says, that is what we're going to do, regardless of how we feel about it. And our feelings have been getting in the way. Just like the feel, my feelings got in the way. And I started believing, well, God doesn't even want this thing. How, how do you think that God doesn't want to share the news about prayer with his people? But we'll deceive ourselves into thinking that it is the will of God because it's no longer what we want. It's no longer what we like. Jonah then began to chase things that would bring him the most comfort. I believe the church has done the same. We want to go after the things that make us feel comfortable and make us feel safe. So we've diluted the, the active and effective power of prayer. We have severed our communication with God. There are many people talking, but there are not many people speaking with God. But it is even more important to know that as great as self may be, it doesn't have the power to change the word of God, and it doesn't have the power to change our God-given identity. Self can be sort of like a lunar eclipse. Do you know what happens when there's a lunar eclipse? The earth, which would be us, that would be self, gets in the way of the sun and the moon, and everything is dark. Now, let's see. The sun is Jesus Christ. The moon is the church. Self gets in the way of the two things, and all of a sudden, there's darkness in the world. All it, the, the power of each one remains the same. The sun is still as bright. The moon still ke keeps all of its properties. The earth is exactly the same, but the effect that we have on the universe is different. So we have to say, as the people that have been called to radiate the light of Jesus Christ, I need to get myself out of the way. I need to get my desires out of the way. I need to uh, stop malpositioning myself and just walk and go wherever God is asking me to do. Jonah decided, I'm, no, this is not for me. I'm out. So what does he do? He goes into a boat where he finds out my second point. First point is wake up and see that you are the church of Jesus Christ. Don't forget who your identity is. That's why we have to be, go through this process of rebirth so that somebody can once again name us and tell us who we are, remind us who we are, so that then we can wake up and see that our priorities must change. Our priorities as a church have gotten distorted. Remember, it was the God of the storm who came to show Jonah that his faith, was, his faith was unstable and his priorities were out of place. Now, if you are like me, I know there's one person, at least one person in this place that is like me in this manner, and that would be Pastor Mona. If we are going to travel, we're not going to travel light. Do you travel light? You don't travel light. There's no way you travel light. So... I love cruising. Man, I was supposed to go on a cruise this year, and it was right when a big storm hit, and my cruise was canceled. And last year was a really tough year. So every time something tough would happen, I would say, it's okay, because I'm going on a cruise. It's okay. So when my cruise was canceled, I was like, <gasps> like, you know, it was tough. But whenever you're going to go on a cruise, you can't take everything you own. You have to go through all the things, and you have to think about the days that you're going to spend there, and you have to go through all your shoes, and you have to go through all your outfits, and you got to start picking, oh, this is important. Oh, I can't live without this. I got to put this in the bag. And then you're, like, taking the bag and just, like, like uh, trying to zip everything, and you're just trying to make it work and see if you can fit one more thing. Oh, and the weight thing. Now you have to weight your bag, right, because you can't even take all the weight that you want. Even if it fit in there, but it's not within the weight limits, you got to start purging, you know. I always take an extra bag to the airport just in case I have to take other things off, you know. Because it's cheaper to put it in another bag than to pay for another bag just, just in case you don't know. Anyways, so, so you have to decide what your priorities are, right. And especially if you're going to go on a boat. So Jonah 
went through his things and he said, oh, this is the most important. I got to take this. I gotta. And then he just ran. He got on a boat. And once he got into the boat, the God of the storm, because this is the thing, you and I will get our priorities wrong. We will make mistakes. We will try to run. But how many know of a God that will chase us down, that will find us where we are? You, can't, you can run, but you can't hide. And there is a per. if God has assigned a purpose over your life, you know what? You can go, you can decide to go through 15 storms, but one of those storms is going to get you. You're not going to run. If he said you're going to be, you're going to be. Sooner or later, he's going to catch up. That's, that's the power of the grace of God. And, and, and somewhere along the line, this man, this prophet who was so proficient in speaking, he convinced himself that he knew better than God. And the people of Nineveh did not deserve to be saved. So since I know better, I'm going to go to a whole other different direction. He was going through uh, uh, towards an unknown world. Because back in those days, you know, they didn't have the maps that we have. He was going towards a direction where nobody would know him, where he would be lost. He didn't have to have the responsibility of doing whatever God is asking me to do. I don't have to do it because I know better. Maybe we don't say it with as much, but we say it. This is why the, the word of God will teach us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, it says, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Today, more than ever, I'm watching people, pastors, ministers, people that used to be the dependable ones going through this smog of confusion, but making themselves believe that the word of God is saying things about themselves that is so contrary to the character of God. And if it's not aligned with the character of God, it is not God. And I'll read the scriptures and I'll say, well, the word of God says this. And they're like, yep. And for a moment is that light goes on. But then the next second they're like, uh, yeah, no. I really think God is telling me this. So we go through our lives and we decide what's important. But then God sends a storm. And let me tell you something. The storm, storms are bad. As a matter of fact, you saw my baby picture, right? That's probably one of the only living pictures. It took me forever to find a baby picture. Why? Because when I was a little girl, I went literally through a storm that took my house. They took us out in little boats. We lost everything. My mom was able to save a few pictures. And after she saved a few pictures, we went through a fire that burned everything. So you know that scripture that says, when you go through the waters, you will not drown? Hey. When you go through the fire, you will not get burned? I am evidence. That was for me. It is real. So here we are, taking all the things, all our possessions, and deciding what's important, what's not important. Not including God in the decisions when we prioritize things in our lives. And then God, out of his grace and his mercy, he will send a storm your way. He will send the winds and he will send the waves because how many of us know, just like David in Psalms 139, 7, 8, where it says, where can I go for your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I can go up to the heavens and guess what? You're there. I can make my bed in the depths and guess what? You are there. You can't hide from him. He sees you wherever you go. So wherever you go, he'll make sure that there's a plan to stop you in your tracks and to return you to the will of the Father. So when you're in a boat and the storm comes, one of the first things that you got to do is reassess everything that's on the ship because you have to lighten the load of the boat if it has any hopes of surviving. So you have to take all the things that you already said that they were super important. Oh, I can't, you kidding me? I cannot travel without this mascara. Like, no way. I need my flat iron. I need, how many, I made a list for my daughter who's coming tonight for all the things that I left behind that I can't live without. All these things, you know, you make, like, 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 uh, you, you know you just can't do without. So you already assess it. You already prioritize it. But now when the storm comes, reality hits. 
and you start really wondering, can I live without, with, with this or without it? And then you have to ask yourself even a more important question. Is this thing that I'm holding on to worth my life? Because it's not just whether you like it or you don't like it or you need it in your opinion. Is, is this going to kill me if I stay holding on to this thing? Jonah had to realize that his priorities were so wrong. God sent a storm to awaken everybody on that boat and to let them know that there are things in uh, that they're, first of all, going in the wrong direction, but there are things that they're carrying that they should not be carrying. And God was about to shift things, not just for Jonah, but also for the people on that boat. The second thing, the third thing we need to wake up and see is that God is the God of the storm. One of the things in John 10.10 10 that we learn is, um, and it's a common knowledge, we quote it all the time, um, that the enemy comes to rob, kill, and destroy, Right? So whenever we start facing the winds and the disorder in our lives, automatically, how many are like, oh, the devil, oh, the devil this, the devil that. And every time we see disorder and chaos, we think that the devil is in control of the situation. But if we can just go to Genesis 1-1 and we can see what was happening there. In Genesis 1-1, everything was perfect. Genesis 1-2, I don't know what happened. Everything was chaos. All of a sudden, this thing that was perfection, it was all messed up. It was all over the place. And I don't know what happened. Maybe we'll never know what happened until we get to heaven. But there's one thing that I do know, that in the midst of all of that chaos, in the midst of, of all of that storm, whatever storm passed through there, the Spirit of the Lord was still upon the waters. The Spirit of the Lord was still in control. He was not moved by the winds. He was not placed out of order by whatever storm passed through there and we need to understand that our God is in control at all times we need to stop crediting the enemy for the things that God is doing in our lives the reason why Job went through his storm is because God said go ahead you can do that why because he was going to be with Job he was going to get him through and in the end Job was going to have so much more than he had ever dreamed or imagined he has a plan and he has control he is not losing control our God is the God of the storm. The universe suffered consequences, but God, when he, when he just started speaking, he didn't only just put things in order, but he just made it even better than before. Throughout the scriptures, we see that God uses storms to teach us things. Look at the life of Noah, Genesis 6 through 9. God revealed that he can use the storm to separate righteousness from sin. The storm proved to have a different effect on those that were in Christ than those that were outside of Christ. Sinners are going to lose their lives in the middle of a storm. Oh, but the righteous are going to be shielded by the power of his grace. Peter, Matthew 14, 22, 33. God revealed the reality of Peter's faith. The storm demonstrated that Peter thought higher of himself, daring to take some risk without maturing in faith. Because Peter did have some faith. What he did not have was a mature faith to get him through. But the good thing about Jesus Christ is that even when we take risk with our little seed of faith, he's always there to lift us up and to walk us back to where we need to get started all over again he's always willing to save us Jesus in Matthew 8 23 to 27 and Mark 4 35 to 41 God revealed a peace that transcends all understanding the storm did not affect the rest of Jesus you know what was affecting his rest the people that were on the boat that believe in their desperation that God was not stronger than the storm. When you start trusting in the power of the storm over the power of your God, then God is going to have to glorify himself in the middle of the storm and tell you, why chill, girl? Yesterday, I got a phone call. I'm trying to get ready. And somebody's like, wah, 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 wah. and I'm going like, really? Like, chill. And you know what? They were calling me desperate about something that might happen. 
I don't got time for the negative things that might happen in your life. Now, if you want to call me so I can pray some things into existence in your future, I'm more than happy to pray with you. Paul, in Acts chapter 27, 13 to 44, God reveals his faithfulness. Paul was in a ship as a prisoner filled with pagans. That whole ship was filled. Nobody knew about Jesus Christ. Nobody knew about God. And he was an expert uh, in oratory skills. He, he was able to speak to them, and, and he tried. But guess what? Nothing was working. So what does God do? He sends a storm, and he wrecks the whole ship. And guess what? Nobody gets lost. Everybody gets saved. Why? Because they were in all of that storm, in the whole storm, in the chaos that was happening, Pete, um, Paul never lost his sense of hearing God. He never lost his sense of what the Spirit was asking him to do. In Jonah's life, God revealed that he can return the faith to those who have lost it. I believe the church of Jesus Christ, in our own way, we have lost some of our faith. Even when we pray, check yourself, be real, ask yourself, do you really believe that God is going to do what you're asking him? So many of us are coming to the Lord like in this beggar's position thinking that the God is looking at us and just toying with us and, and playing with our feelings and, and, and just, you know, treating us in a way that, that, that we are not, as if we weren't his children, but God's love, nothing can separate us from his love. And our good and bad decisions are going to affect the people around us. You might think that your prayer life is just about you, but whatever you pray for and whatever you don't pray for is going to affect the world around you. The decisions that Jonah made affected every single person on that boat. It put the lives of every one of them in danger. These were expert navigators. These men were not, you know, okay, I'm just going to, the other day, the other day we went on a boat ride, and I was so unsure about that, that, that um, captain, oh, my God. These guys were not that. They were experts in navigation, and they were able to perceive, wait a minute, there's something about this storm that's not right. This is not natural. They were like, eh, you know what? Right now, the world is looking at us, and they're going, there's something just not right. They're looking at the church. We're getting mad because they're criticizing us. We're getting mad because they're talking about us. They don't respect the church, but guess what? There's just something not right. There's something not right about the storm, and they knew they knew this is not normal. So they started calling on their gods. They, start, they were the first ones to call on their gods. And when nothing was happening, they were like, okay, there's something. So they're looking for somebody to blame. And the world and all the chaos that is around us is looking for somebody to blame. And guess what? They're casting lots, and the lot is falling on the church. We are guilty of running away when he is calling us to speak. We have been guilty of acting indifferent to the calling and our identity and who we have been brought, been brought into this world to be. God has sent this storm. I know there's chaos all around us, but God has sent this storm so that we can wake up and see that we are the church of Jesus Christ, so that we can wake up and see that our priorities have to change. We have to wake up and see that today is a new chapter. Today is a day of rebirth. For a moment, knowing the truth that led to all the chaos didn't do them much good. When they found out that it was Jonah, because Jonah had to make, do a, this is why prayer is so important. We are going to have to confess. There, there needs to be a time of confession. I pray that this morning that we can come together and just come before the Lord and not because some of us are sitting there going, no, not me, not me. It's you. 
it's you, it's me. You can't, you can't, I, I can't stand people who are like, I can serve Christ, but I don't have to be a part of the church. That's so anti-Jesus. Jesus could, if there's anyone that says, I don't have to go to church, it should have been Jesus. They don't want to love the rest of the body. No, no, they just, no. We're going to have to come to a place where we say, Lord, forgive us for our pride. Forgive us for our ignorance. Forgive us for the times that we presented the gospel in a way that is not in love. And we've caused people to fall versus, instead of um, getting to know you better. We have to ask God to forgive us. Today we can start a new chapter. All this chaos, all this mess, all the storm. The Bible says in James 5.13, if any of you are in trouble, pray. We need to pray and ask God to forgive us. The word of God also says that we just humble ourselves. And come, he is going to not just forgive us, but he's going to heal our land. So if there's no healing in our land, if there is no forgiveness in our land, then that means that we are not operating in the truth of the power that we have in prayer. And when they found out, when Jonah finally fessed up and he was like, it was me, it was me, I did it. Jonah 1.10 says, this terrified them. And they asked them, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already uh, told them so. It wasn't enough to calm the sea. Confession was not enough to calm the sea. Now, what we thought is priority needed to be sent overboard. We needed to throw away all the things that we prioritized over God. Jonah prioritized himself over God. So the moment came where he had to decide, I am going to take myself out of first place. I'm just going to, because God, Jonah knew that God was in the storm. So he basically, what he was doing was baptizing himself. He was saying, you know what? It's baptismal time. I am just going to throw myself in the water. As a matter of fact, he couldn't do it. So he had these non-ministers baptize him. These pagan men who all of a sudden recognize this is um, a man of God. He's running from the real God. Now he needs to be thrown over. What He didn't have the courage to do it himself just like you don't have the courage to do it all on your own. That's why tomorrow at 3.30 you need to sign up and you need to say, Lord, I am going to allow Pastor Mona, Pastor Matthew, whoever, to come in and dunk me in the water. And I'm going to leave that old man behind because when Jonah came out of those waters he did not come out the same man he was not the old prophet he was not the current prophet he was a brand new prophet so what does God want to do with us this weekend in this time of rebirth he wants us to wake up wake up tell the girl next to you just wake up wake up and see that we are the church Wake up and see that our priorities must change. Wake up and see that God is the God of the storm. Also, wake up and see that the world is desperately asking for prayer. Because one of the lies of the enemy is, don't pray because the world doesn't even want to know about your God. But that is a blatant lie. The world is asking questions like, who are you? Where are you coming from? Where? Because they want to know. They want to know not what your name is. They want to know where the power is behind your identity. And wake up and see that today is a new chapter, is a new time for rebirth. Pastor Mona, I believe that women are just going to sign up because we're, I, I don't know about you, but I'm done with this mindset, with this confusion, with this, I want to see real power. It's there. It's there. It's in the word of God. And we just have to decide, Lord, this morning we're just going to surrender to you. Father, we're going to allow ourselves the space to enthrone you one more time in our lives. Father, we are so sorry for the many conceptions that we have fallen into when it comes to prayer 
And today, Lord, we're going to pray the prayer of Jonah chapter 2. And this, I will end with this. This is when he was in the belly of the fish. Jonah prayed this. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. He said, in my distress, I called the Lord, and he answered me. For deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me in the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me, and your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters, they threatened me. They, they deeply surrounded me with seaweed and wrapped around, with seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me forever. But you, Lord my God, you brought me back to life. You gave me a rebirth. When, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. Lord, my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to uh, worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise I would sacrifice unto you what I have vowed I will make good I will say salvation comes from the Lord let us stand and wake up this morning let us ask God to allow us to wake up and see that it is not too late to bring the power of prayer to activate an effective lifestyle of prayer where all will once again know that this is the house of prayer when you're in trouble this is where you come when when anything happens people will know to run to jubilee people will know to run to you because you're not only talking about prayer but you are the living evidence that prayer actually works and is active and effective god bless you i love you jubilee thank you for having me Before uh, Pastor Val, I, I just have a word from you from the Lord. Um, as you were speaking um, and talking about your journey with, with your book, uh, the Lord wanted me to share with you that the last decade in the Hebrew calendar was the decade of the I, I-N. It was the decade that you saw the blueprint. It wasn't the time. So it... it, it he had you write it to show you that you could do it. And he deleted it. Your children were too young. There were some storms that you had to go through that were gonna make you firmly planted for the season that you're in right now. And then he said, this is the decade of the mouth, pay. It's no coincidence that you wrote your book in the last decade. But this decade is the decade of declaration. This is the decade that you will declare what you saw, that you will do what you saw. The blueprint that he gave you is now you're walking out because Melody is now old enough. She's old enough for you to do what God has called you to do in this season. Because family is important to you. I didn't know that your family went through uh, a flood, fire, all of that, but all of that was for a reason. Because you will go through floods and you will go through fires, but you will declare the word of God like never before. There were some talents that you had that God wanted you to use in the last season because those talents are now your history. The declaration of what God is calling to you is your destiny. So go forth, and God is going to give you every single thing you need because you have entered into Jubilee. And we are connected. We are family. And because you've entered into the land of Jubilee, everything that you need, you already have. Whatever you're believing God for, he wants you to know that it's already inside of you, that out of your belly shall flow living waters, that healing belongs to you.
victory belongs to you. God is doing a new thing and he is showing up in a way that you could never imagine. And this is the year that you will see, you will declare, and you will have everything that was written in the book that God made called Valerie. In the name of Jesus, amen.